Got a good group here from all over the place. Wow, cool. All right. Georgia, Oregon, Florida, Scotland, cool. Connecticut, South Carolina, Tennessee, very cool. Well, we're really excited to be with y'all today. And with that, I will turn it over to Andrew Gunther, our Executive Director of A Greener World and a webinar host with the most today. Over to you, Andrew. Hey, Amity, thank you. And obviously a big thank you to you and your team for putting the webinar together. And thank you for everybody for, for jumping on. Um, I, I can claim some Scottish heritage in so much as my father um, was Scottish and um, uh, very, very proud of it. So I'm, I'm really, really humbled to have some folks from north of the border um, on the call, so welcome. Um, and obviously to my, my adopted nation, thank you everybody from the US for jumping on. I think we're expecting some folks from as far away as, as Africa. And maybe just, just while we let <clears throat> folks come in, um, you know, um, honeybees and chickens, cute. Um, a little bit about a, a greener world. So we're a not-for-profit, we're a charity. Uh, we're funded by donations. So for clarity, you know, people, uh, you know, help us to, to do what we do across our spectrum by making donations, which obviously allows us to offset um, uh, costs to you, um, uh, to the farmer, the producer. Um, and our main role, the reason we get up in the morning is to um, identify, certify, uh, audit, and promote sustainable farms across the world. We work on four continents, soon to be five, with about 6,000 farmers and about a million acres in total, uh, with our flagship program, Animal Welfare Approved. Um, you know, for those of you that, that sort of don't know very much about us, it's considered to be the number one animal welfare seal uh, in the market. Um, it was founded about, whoosh, gosh, I want to say 13 years ago now, and most of my team have been with me since the start, so when we got there. Um, it's got a, a journey that started with animal welfare approved and some of our farmers are being asked by their retailers to talk about grass fed. So we added grass fed to our seals and then some of our farmers were talking about non GM uh, and we added that to it. Now, our job is to be the highest standard you can be. So we're audited annually, unlike other uh, grass fed claims. Uh, we forbid urea unlike some other grass fed claims. Um, and, and we require the animals to actually get all of their diet from birth to death from pasture grass it can be saved or otherwise um, but it, it's from it's from grass it's not any any you know used spent grain or, or other cheats that people are into uh, non-gm we have the lowest tolerance for gm at all uh, it's right up there with the eu requirement of uh, 0.09 um, which is actually the tolerance for the testing kit all that's just to say that as an organization our feet are firmly planted in uh, agriculture our feet are firmly planted in promoting farmers, not, not to the point that farmers control us, but to the point that farmers feed us. We see farmers as the custodians of the countryside. They're the people that take care of the planet that we live on. They have impact on our soils. They have impact on our, on our water and impact on our air. So they're a critical part <clears throat> of what we are and what we do. But we also have to understand that some of the agricultural systems and some of the agricultural practices that farmers have been forced to do, and I believe this strongly because people haven't been willing to see where their food comes from. They'll spend six weeks looking at what car to buy and 30 seconds looking at what food label they're gonna eat. And sometimes they don't even look at the label, they just buy it because it's the cheapest on the shelf. And there's an old adage, right? You get what you pay for. Um, you know, cheap food isn't necessarily cheap. It has a lot of outcomes that we all don't want and we're suffering uh, globally because of that with poor water quality, we are de denigrating our soils on a daily basis. You know, if you live in certain parts of the US right now, you can watch your neighbor's field. The wind speed we've got here at the moment is between 60 and 80 mile an hour. And my neighbor's field is passing over my fields, which is great. I'm getting some extra topsoil right now, but um, you know, we shouldn't be thinking like that. Uh, click, if we don't mind. Thank you, Emily. So what I wanted to do is just start off you know, right at the basics. Um, you know, what is regenerative? And, and to think a little bit about history, right? We've had antibiotic free, natural, naturally raised, all natural, um, you know, family farm. All words came out through marketers. They didn't come out from farmers. They came out from marketers 
to try and get ahead of the market. And not one of them really had any deep meaning and not one of them really addressed the gorilla in the room, which is we can't keep using the planet the way we are. And it was great just to be a uh, Miriam Webster, the, the dictionary of choice uh, on this side of the pond. Regenerate means to be formed or created again and restored to a better state. What a brilliant word. Because that's what farmers are really, really good at. We're really good at, at farming in a way in harmony with the land and the land we're at. And regenerative farming, we believe, this is our definition of it, works to improve soil health, uh, water and air quality, biodiversity. Um, and biodiversity is a really interesting one because actually if you get your farm management to a point that it really is pretty dang good regeneratively, you'll have you know, an exponential explosion of biodiversity. So, you know, as people who are interested in the planet, interested in those sort of things, you're going to see an increase of habitat for the butterflies, an increase of habitat for, for hedgehogs, but for all of those wild animals, right down to the, you know, these, these humble, um, be, you know, beetles that are taking manure and pulling it down, um, you know, right the way through the spectrum. And, 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 you know, earthworms is another interesting point in this. You, you'll, you'll see an increase in earthworms. Earthworms then make the soil healthier. So biodiversity is going to play a big role as we talk about regenerative as we go through. Click. The reason I'm clicking, folks, is we're, we're sort of controlling this in different places. Um, so Emily's very kindly controlling the screen and Lauren is controlling the back side of it. It's not because I'm completely incompetent, although people may say that I am. Regenerative best practices. You're going to hear a lot of that word in the marketplace right now. Best practice, best practice. What is best practice? Um, you know, best practice are a set of actions, activities that are agreed upon as being the best way to achieve something. So what is a best practice around soil? And this is where we're starting to find things can be quite confusing because what is best practice uh, in the highlands of Scotland uh, for soil quality and soil health isn't likely to be best practice for the open plains of let's say you know central the United States um, you know up, up here I, I live on the, the the west coast of the United States I live on high desert we have six and a half inches of precip a year uh, we, we have irrigation we don't know whether irrigated can ever be sustainable but our soil is constantly in flux so best practices are actually relevant to the place the farm is the farmer's practicing it's not necessarily one size fits all and we're going to hear a lot as we come over the next few years about no-till being a solution. So no-till, what does no-till mean? No-till, min-till are all, you know, farmer, farmer phrases for not turning the soil over, not dipping a plow in and, and, and actually turning the ground over. They're about taking a crop off, patting it down, and then putting another crop, seeding another crop into it. And on its face, that seems like a really good idea until you start to replace your plow with plastic as a mulch or a compost or you start to replace your plow with you know uh, a herbicide such as glyphosate um, or you even better get a large can of propane um, stick a burner on the back of the tractor and drive up and down the field burning it there's some really interesting checks and balances when we come to soil health and that's just you know in terms of keeping a top on the soil Never mind what goes into it. You know, talking a little bit about here for folks that don't farm, uh, nitrogen. Uh, the source of nitrogen is, is carbon. It's a derivative of carbon. So in order to produce it, we're, we're using carbon and, and creating a byproduct. And it was interesting, a piece of research last year that, that talked about actually nitrogen might be one of the biggest producers of, of climate, uh, climate gases, climate change gases. Um, but if you're gardening and you're putting on a nice fertilizer to your garden, check it out because that nitrogen is sterilizing your soil, meaning if you water your garden, you need more water to achieve the same results because good soils, healthy soils with good biodiversity will help you maintain water. It, it's that simple. It's a fact. Water. What are the best practices for water? We've, you know, for years... We've seen this as this unending resource. Now we're beginning to understand that just about every piece of water has plastic in it. Uh, every piece of water has some kind of contaminant. If you live where I live up here in the Pacific Northwest, you can test for coffee in our seawater. 
you know, we're drinking so much coffee, goes through the system, and it's actually in the seawater. Air, we know that our air particulates are going up. And again, you know, if in a truly regenerative system, you have to look at the intersection of all these and how you take care of them all. This idea, which we're, we're not very comfortable with, that, 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 you know, regenerative agriculture is just about carbon, it's not. It's about water, it's about air, it's about soil, it's about people, and it's about livestock. Livestock, we have forever pushed our livestock to the point we've made them sick. Uh, we've pushed chickens so hard that biologically they become ill and we have to use prophylactic antimicrobials to keep them alive. Or we don't do that and we have antibiotic free and then you have mortality of 20% in the flock where you're not treating animals um, you know, and they're dying because they're not being treated, or you're looking at um, another form of, of antimicrobial tr uh, treatment, um, and what then happens is you change the gut of the chicken, which means its fecal matter becomes exceptionally runny, the bedding becomes incredibly wet, then you have pododermatitis, which, you know, for those of you that, 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 that want to cringe a little bit, it's considered like walking backwards and forwards over hot coals all of your life. Um, because the pedodermatitis burns a hole in the chicken's foot. So there are checks and balances and consequences to everything we do. So if the livestock are present on the regenerative holding, they should be kept to best practices, not to optimum practices. So outdoors on, on pasture and range. And that might mean for some, you, you might not be able to have a chicken twice a day every day. You know, your chicken burger in the morning and a, and a you know chicken dinner at night. Because... You know, chicken may not be long-term part of a, of a genuinely regenerative farm. They're going to have to find a way to integrate. <clears throat> um, you know, I'm a great fan. We're great fans of ruminants. Uh, you know, every cow has a superpower, um, and they should have a T-shirt, and their superpower is turning cellulose into protein. And they're the only being on the planet that can do that. They take cellulose, they process it, they grow, i.e. grass, um, and then we can eat them. Uh, there is no nobody else that can do that. We can't take cellulose and digest it at all. Um, you know, so clearly ruminants have a role. And then if we're talking about removing nitrogen from a, a system, the livestock then have a crucial role bringing in nutrient for other forms of cropping and balancing. Land use and cropping. Well, this is an interesting one. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, it's going to be really interesting as time goes by because monocropping has been shown to destroy the soil. And if we accept the soil is integral to a regenerative practice, we're gonna to have to stop monocropping. We're gonna to have to look at how our land use is and we're gonna to have to get into rotation, or we're gonna to have to partner with somebody on the farm next door that has livestock and we can use their manure to build our farm and then give them protein back to feed their animals. But we're gonna to have to get back to the practice of local supply chains working together in order to get best practice for land use and cropping. Wild harvesting is, is an interesting one for me because, you know, there are a lot of things that I grew up being able to get a hold of, whether it was, you know, uh, blackberries or whatever it was, you know, elderflower out of the hedgerows. Um, you know, in some places you can eke a living from the woodlands and forest. So, you know, wild harvesting matters. And also, you know, we, we have to look at some of the, the, the social consciousness that's arising. Um, you know, our indigenous landowners pretty much farmed in harmony and took what they needed uh, you know <coughs> this last 70 to 100 years mankind's been pretty greedy um you know both financially and taking you know what wasn't there so wild harvesting is going to have a role to play um in all of this in respect for uh, indigenous uh, cultures um who, who once owned the land and that, that conversation is going to be tricky over the next 20 years. But I do think, we do think, it's part of a, a holistic approach to regenerative practices. Biodiversity, we talked a little bit about earlier. You know, it, 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 if you get things right on your farm, and we did a piece of research two years ago, um, and we were shocked at what people were finding on their farm from, you know, some pretty serious, you know, high-level predators, your wolves, your bears, um, you know, right the way through to some very, very rare um, you know, butterflies and, and, and beetles, which was incredible. But, but, you know, but we forget our biodiversity. We spray ourselves into oblivion. We wipe out the bumblebee and the bee. 
Um, and without them, we're dead because without pollinators, there is no farming in the future. So I'm, I'm hoping you begin to see how all of these things are interacting with each other um, in a way that, that actually regenerative best practices are not just one. It is a, a holistic group of activities the farmer and the supply chain have to take in order to be truly regenerative. And some farms out there are really at the cutting edge of this practice. We're here to try and bring other farms up to that level where there are buildings. I, I, I remember dreaming of a brand new barn, um, you know, being able to, the concrete was level and I could scrape it out. But what we're asking people to do is to look at your buildings and can you reuse them rather than rip them down and put up, you know, something else. And the buildings you do have, are, are they as efficient as they could be? Um, and we're being helped by that with the price of electricity. So, you know, being able to make my building, you know, as efficient as it can be, that helps save on the electricity bill, helps decrease demand for energy, which ultimately will decrease, um, you know, some of the negative um, actions of, of, uh, of, of, of energy production. And just while we're there, I don't think we've got a note in here. You know, it's important to recognize that, in a truly regenerative system, the vehicles we drive and the vehicles we use every day, uh, we need to account for what they're up to uh, and what their impact is. And it's an interesting one. I did a piece of work, gosh, about 10 years ago, eight years ago, no, maybe 11 years ago, um, looking at, um, looking at um, the way uh, farmers got food to market. Uh, and the question I had is, is it more, if, you know, more, uh, environmentally sustainable for one large farmer with one large truck to take all of their pigs to one slaughter plant than it is for 20 farmers with quite older um, vehicles and trailers to take those pigs to the slaughter plant and it's an interesting one that that got me always thinking about this you know because it clearly isn't it, the most efficient way is one lorry uh, highly serviced built for purpose um, you know, taking all these other other than these little old chugger bugs, we have one, you know, 10 year old truck. I'm sure it pollutes the planet. But those are the things we're asking farmers to think about. And we should all be thinking about it. You know, is, is their infrastructure, um, you know, as uh, as good as it can be. Um, just, just to touch back, you know, I talked about monocropping and sometimes we do talk a little quickly and perhaps a little bit, you know, too, too, um, to jargony, um, you know, monocropping is, is the issue where you simply each year plant the same crop. Um, so if you grow potatoes, you keep growing potatoes. The negative of doing that is you have something called potato blight, just one disease, and then you need to treat the potato blight, and then you, you, you end up having to use copper sulfate or whatever for the potato blight. Um, and then you go down the road where they've created a GMO potato that is resistant to blight, which might sound like an absolute godsend until you come to a space that I found myself on this journey, we're continually as a society treating the symptoms, not the cause. You know, and if you look at that across every spectrum, whether it's homelessness, whether it's poverty, whether it's, it's food deserts, whether it's in agriculture where chickens become sick, they become sick because we're not keeping them correctly. We're putting them under too much pressure so they become sick therefore they need antibiotics and it is the same with the soil you keep planting the same crop ultimately you know diseases build up um you know and and, and you destroy the, the soil regenerative best practice is going to include a human element we we certainly in the united states aren't too keen on paying our workers a good wage uh we are very keen on people who are not white um having to work for minimum wage to be in this country um and all down the agricultural supply chain. Again, interesting piece of research that we did, we found a lot of our farmers who are at the cutting edge of sustainability do pay fair wages. Um, and if they can't have healthcare, they were very concerned about not providing healthcare. Um, and they were sort of making it up with giving the, 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 the workers uh, some of their product <coughs> for free. But we have to you know, face this one head on there is a real cost to cheap food and human poverty and the word slavery have to be addressed in the food supply chain and regenerative practice must address that. Um, we must have best practices in taking care of our workers. 
And, and then the last one, um, which is the most important one of all, we've got to make sure the farmer's making a living. They've got to be able to reinvest in their farm. Their children have to be able to go to college. They've got to be able to have a decent car and whatever they want, when they want, within reason. It's unfair to expect a farmer to go out, work an eight-hour day in the field, and then have a second job so a consumer can buy a $2 chicken. That's absolutely insane. We have to get agriculture to the point, um, you know, that, 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 you know, farmers are paid fairly for what they do. And, and they are, you know, they're effectively, their supplies of our nutrition, their supplies of our medicine. They feed us. Uh, and we have to be respectful in the regenerative agriculture as to, to making sure they make money and they can stay in business. Uh, click, please. So what are some of the opportunities for a positive impact of regenerative system? Climate changes are coming. Um, it's got a ton of reasons. Uh, agriculture has um, a role to play, uh, without doubt. We are not. Uh, farming agriculture is not the major cause of the change in the climate. The major cause to the climate is, is human activity, whether it can be uh, power plants, uh, you know, um, uh, flying, all of those things. But don't get me wrong, I'm not saying ignore agriculture. What I'm saying is, can we please, please stop, you know, railing on farmers that they are the only reason. We have a role to play in climate change. We can play an important role, and we should, but we cannot keep blaming farmers for the situation we find ourselves in. When you go out and buy the new iPhone 12, remember the iPhone 11 probably works just as well and caused a ton of, of, of um, pollutants when it was made, and now you're going to discard it and you're going to get a 12. Uh, when you go and buy a 72-inch TV rather than a 58-inch TV, do you really need it? Because there's, there's a lot of drivers going on here for things that do pollute the lead and the mercury in, in TV and other production. And yet we seem to have to have them. And yet we don't seem to worry about where our food comes from. That, that seems to me a huge disconnect there um, in our thinking. Again, going back to we spend three months researching a car and three seconds researching a chicken breast. Um, there seems to be something really wrong. The disruption to the ecosystems caused by farming, you know, we, we don't need to chop down rainforest. We really don't need to chop down rainforest. And, and there is no reason to chop down a rainforest. But when you value farming purely as a pound uh, of product, a kilo of product, you know, and a penny of profit, the ecosystem is the least valuable because nobody sees any real value in it um, until it's too late. But we need, there's a huge opportunity here for regenerative farmers to <coughs> rebuild ecosystems. Um, and to reconfigure ecosystems. Are we going to get these, these you know, old growth forests back? Sadly, no, but we shouldn't be chopping down any more, particularly to provide soy to feed to a cow. I don't get that. Why would you feed a cow soy? Um, oh, profit. It's got nothing to do with taste, texture, or the cow wanting soy or needing soy. It's got to do with the speed with which you can grow the animal <coughs> and turn your investment into, into profit. And what you've now got, particularly in some of these um, systems, you've actually got investors that are just investing in the growth part when an animal is put on a feedlot and they pump it full of soy and other feeds to get a penny a pound. That's not even going to a real farmer. That's going to an investor. <clears throat> and the investor is backing a company that's growing far, uh, cattle on a feedlot. There's no farming required there at all. The farmer raised the animal, brought it to... <laughs> a weight of 800 pounds or 440 kilos um, and, and then sold it to a feedlot where it's stuffed full of food and then goes off to slaughter. I, I think we have to look at some of these systems um, and the way who is profiting and who's taking money out of them. But more importantly, the ecosystem's completely disrupted if you've kept your animal on pasture for 18 months of its life and then you throw it in a feedlot for three months and feed it soy or corn um, which is known to destroy soils. The big one, um, and this is so easy for anybody over the age of 21, and I'll tell you I'm 57, um, remember driving home at night and your windscreen in the summer would look like World War IV, you know, or, or whatever it is, one of the war um, online games with all the dead 
uh, beetles, uh, uh, moths and everything on your windscreen. Now you drive home and there are hardly any. There couldn't be a greater um, <coughs> sign of a loss of biodiversity than a car's windscreen. And, and wildlife habitats, you know, we all grew up being able to see a fox here or a rabbit there or a badger here or a badger there. They're disappearing. And they're disappearing j just simply because of our farming practices. Um, I'm humbled to live in an area where um, we have a, a lot of raptors. We have seven different raptors from the bald eagle, which were, is big enough to take one of our biggest roosters or male chickens, cockbird, <coughs> you know, down to uh, kites um, and, um, and, and others. We, we have a, an, owl, an owl whose wingspan is 48 inches. Um, but that's because I live in an area where we grow seed. Um, a lot of my neighbors grow carrot seed and other seeds, so they're not spraying. So they're not actually poisoning the voles in the ground. Um, they're just part of their farming technique. And it's quite interesting, they live with them. Um, it, it is just part of it. But we are, we are you know, we, there are opportunities here for, for, for improving diversity in wildlife habitat. Check. So what role um, can we play, um, can regenerative play? We've talked about a little bit, but I think, you know, if we farm well, we will increase soil health. What, what we, you should mean by soil health is soil biodiversity, uh, soil organic matter, um, uh, you know, and, and you know, soil depth. Um, we can change the way we use water. We can use less of it. So in our production systems, we can think about introducing systems that you use less water um, and how our activities on the farm uh, impact the air quality. I think that's absolutely crucial. I think we all do. <laughs> and if you have health, healthy animals, uh, and I get told off, but healthy, happy animals, and for the farmers on here, they'll know what this means. When you look over the gate, you can see if your cows are right. You can see if your sheep are right. Um, one health, <laughs> um, you know, uh, 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 equals a healthy planet. Uh, uh, absolutely. Um, you know, it, it's sort of, it, it, we've got to get used to this all being interconnected, all, all being interconnected uh, again, where it's been disconnected. We've applied the Henry Ford principle to the way we live, you know, where we take things down to its, 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 its basic components and then we separate them, but they're not, they're all interconnected. If we don't care of our, take care of our air, we won't take care of our people and our lungs. Um, um, you know, all, all, all of those sort of things that are absolutely crucial. We, we have to move away from fossil fuels. And it's really interesting that, you know, here we put lowest harmful emissions. It absolutely does. Um, but with electric cars, we have to be worried about the battery. Then we have to be worried about, excuse me, take a quick swig of water. But it's sort of, you know, understanding what, what the outcome of getting rid of batteries. But if we're moving away from nitrogen in our agricultural practices, nitrogen is also a sterilizer it sterilizes the soil. It's not good for biodiversity. So we need to move away from fossil fuels, period, in our, um, in, in, in our agricultural practice. So, you know, looking at how we can, you know, use our machinery on farm the best way we can and have the most up-to-date, um, you know, maintained machinery. I'm not saying buy new, but just maintaining it can help with, with, with fuel consumption. But there are other things we do. We all jump on an aeroplane. I'm the world's worst. I, I, you know, I have a million miles in with three airlines. Um, you know, we have to stop the need to fly everywhere. I just just has just has to move away. And I, and I just wanted to to touch on you know something um, talking about soil soil sterilizers, um, glyphosate, um, which is Roundup, um, is patented as an antimicrobial, um, antibiotic, if you will, but not quite. Um, which means when you spray it on the ground, it sterilizes the ground. It kills bacteria. And if we're looking for healthy soil, we need bacteria. Bacteria make healthy soils. Our stomachs are full of good and bad bacteria. Normally, they're quite well balanced. Um, and, and we just need these good bacteria in every piece of our life. And then regenerative farming, truly regenerative farming, will preserve and increase and create biodiversity. It, it just will happen. But also in regenerative uh, agriculture, biodiversity is going to be even more crucial in terms of animal genetics and crop genetics. 
Uh, at the moment, uh, two companies own, I think, 98% of the genetic pool for all the chickens uh, eaten in the world. Uh, in the pig area, I think you're down into the 60s and 70 percent. And I, I haven't done any work in here for a long time, but two companies own all, all the pig genetics um, kicking around. In cattle, it's less. Um, it is far more difficult just because of the production cycle for somebody to, to own all the genetics. But we are getting rid of genetics we're going to need um, at the periphery, at the edge. And some of these genetics come with incredible attributes. There are sheep and goats out there that are immune to worms. No worm can live in them, no parasite can host in them. Um, there are cattle that are far more efficient in eating upland grasses. And what I mean by upland is, you know, areas where you've gone higher, the rain isn't as much, um, or in some parts of the world, the rain is more, but it's, it's quite cold and, and the grasses don't grow as well. Um, so there are various genetic pools that we must preserve and we don't preserve them. That doesn't mean to say we must all have, but there are ways you can help. Um, we're gonna talk about things people can do at the end of this and have some conversations, you know, where we can look at things you can do. So if you can find a farmer that's got belted Galloway or find a farmer that's got something, by preserving those genetics, they might just be the genetics that get us out of a hole in 10 years time. Uh, click please, Emily. So what are the other benefits and what do they need to be? Uh, I mean, they're not necessarily benefits of regenerative because if you look at other regenerative conversations going on right now, worker conditions aren't necessarily uh, being taken into consideration. Uh, investment in local communities if you're producing your food locally. But a lot of our ag agro eco, uh, eco agrological systems, so eco business type agro agricultural systems are not owned by the local community. Um, the only money that goes back into that community is the minimal wages they pay their farmers, you know, for things like, you know, bananas and, and uh, all of those sort of things coming in from abroad. Um, regenerative gives us an ability to start looking at that by saying, actually, I want my food to be fair to everybody in the supply chain. And there are a couple of seals that work in that area. <clears throat> fair Trade Coffee did a lot to change the coffee industry. Um, and certainly the coffee folks are still. Uh, you know, it's really important for the coffee folk where their coffee's coming from. But we are seeing scare stories, right, where people are going in to look at places and they're finding, you know, basically slave internment camps just off the farm where the workers live so that they're not part of the overall uh, audit uh, uh, and the workers aren't being seen as folks who are just impoverished and have to work there. Um, more nutritious food, there's, there's absolutely a ton of science. Uh, that talks about you know greater availability of nutrition um, it, within systems that that, that are uh, regenerative or or more sustainable, if you will. I think around the word regenerative, it's not there yet, but the practices in regenerative would imply that they cross over into from others into uh, this space. Uh, definitely a more resilient food system. I mean, you know, COVID nineteen, we cannot escape it, and I'm sorry if anybody on this call has been directly deeply impacted, you know, our own impact is we've been locked in and we lost most of our business and we're about to lose it again on Wednesday because our state's about to shut all its restaurants. But one of the issues we had as an organization, we had farmers who couldn't keep up with supply because they had direct supply, but we had farmers like ourselves who supply restaurants um, and the restaurants shut. So we lost all of our market overnight. If we have this more local food system, this more focused food system and a fairer food system, it would have, you know, things, it would have some slack in it. At the moment, there is no slack in the food system. There is a significant amount of waste uh, in our food system. We throw away, you know, the 40% of the food we take home, I think, in one study, but maybe that's just because we're in America. Um, but a more resilient food system should be, must be the outcome of truly regenerative practices. We can't keep, you know, blaming everybody else for the situation we find ourselves in. As consumers, if we just want cheap food, please expect it to go away if there's a crisis, because there will be no slack in the supply chain. Um, there, there isn't any. Uh, click, please. So how do I know what's regenerative? This is a really interesting point. I think there are three folks out there right now talking about 
um, regenerative agriculture. And, and it's one of the biggest conversations people are having is, you know, well, we can't audit it. We can't, we can't control it. If we don't control it, and if you are bored and, and can't sleep, we've got a, a medium blog that talked about this, you know, a while back. <clears throat> if farmers and advocates don't own regenerative, it will be owned by somebody else and they will make it meaningless. And in two to three years, there will be another word up on the screen. Um, you know, I was banging around 15 years ago, uh, looking at organic, um, you know, as a panacea for everything. Uh, and I was horrified with, with doing a piece of work at the moment to see actually in the United Kingdom, uh, organic acres have dropped back, organic production has dropped back, but organic imports of processed food has gone up. So the actual message, um, you know, around uh, organic obviously got out there, it was good and people should buy it. And then it all got sold out to the highly processed garbage, which they're now importing. That's not helpful to any country's farmers. You know, farmers should be, um, you know, it, it, do, doing this sort of thing. Um, is it backed up? So, you know, so who's making the claim? Are there any standards, genuinely? You know, if you're looking at regenerative, what does it mean to the person saying regenerative? And if it just talks about soil carbon, you should steer away from it. You know, you need to look at all those other things we're talking about, soil health, human health, animal health, all, all of those things. And then are those standards backed up by meaningful certification? Are they at arm's length? Is the certifier not connected? Or the certifier should not be connected to the person they're attributing a certification to? Self-certification has to be a thing of the past. We have shown we cannot certify ourselves. The United States is full of claims made by people. Um, that's a brilliant question, Hugh. Um, is, is, it, you know, it, it's, it's, we've just shown that we can't. We have to have a valid oversight. Our governments don't want to do it because our governments are controlled by big industry. And that's not because I'm a socialist. It's not because I'm a Democrat. It's a fact. You know, I, I would defy anybody to find a real farmer group having access to a government official and that government official genuinely listening to them and then acting on what they said. It doesn't happen. Um, the only they hear, people they want to hear from are the companies who are providing calories to their people. Um, everything else is, is there. And then check with what the consumer advocates say um, about the, the claim itself. You know, go to Consumers Reunion, which or whatever it might be, um, you know, to see if these are legitimate company uh, to be there. So what we've done here um, is a comparison. Obviously, we're the best um, because we are the best. But um, what we come at this from when we look at our seals is, is what does the consumer expect? Um, but this little comparison chart uh, can be used by anybody to look at um, where they are comparing it to. Um, we're hoping to, to peel this off um, to, to independent uh, oversight because obviously it is our own and it's a fairly, um, you know, we start it as an internal document. Um, but, you know, you'll see there are a number of them that, that have the word regenerative in what they talk about. And from our definition of regenerative, they're clearly not. Um, you know, so we would urge you to look at that, um, you know, as, as time goes um, and, and share it if you want and feedback if you feel like we've been unfair. Uh, to anybody in that space um, but we try not to be um, we're driven to be the best we can and we're driven to be independent but obviously our job is to promote what our farmers do so um, you know by all means if you feel like we've been unfair then let us know uh, click so you know what can you do how, how can you find regenerative products what, one of the best ways is to get a really good understanding of what regenerative means um, absolutely please avoid unverified claims. So if, if you haven't got a third party saying it's regenerative because, um, then don't buy into it. But if you've got a local farmer and you know enough and, and you can find the supply chain, get talking to them because farmers love to talk. Listen to me, I've rattled on for 43 minutes without stopping. Um, it's what farmers do. You get two farmers together and they'll solve all the world's problems. But, you know, T take a look at it have a third party if you can it's critical it costs a farmer money but at the end of the end of the day oh another good question um or statement 
uh, why having a third party certification is critical. It just is. I mean, you know, just you, you, again, I go back to a, a car, a horse, a house. Do you believe the vendor when they say, yeah, the electrics are fine or do you have an inspection? You know, do you believe the vendor when they say it's only done 10,000 miles or do you get, you know, a, 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 a credible third party validation? Um, you know, it's just so important. So either know your farmer, get on the farm, learn about it, you know, and see how far down the road they are. And obviously we have our own certification, Certified Regenerative um, by a Greener World. Uh, and there was a really good point, if I may just touch on it, because I think it's so important. Uh, and I think we started the conversation with it. Regenerative systems are different on every farm in every location. And there isn't a one size fits all. Um, you know, and trying to fit this into one pod, it, it doesn't work. And the expert in regenerative systems is actually the farmer on the farm. They, you know, they need to go off if they don't know already, get themselves trained up on what regenerative means, dig into it, write a plan of what they're going to do, and then get somebody like a Greener World to come along, validate that plan with their local experts, and then audit to it annually. That way, you know, we can be flexible. There isn't this one size to be regenerative, you've got to be organic. Well, not quite, because organic has a ton of monocultures. Organic um, has some pretty despicable animal, work, certainly in the United States, some pretty despicable animal welfare standards where you can't treat a sick animal without the animal being taken out of the program. So if a dairy farmer has a mastitic cow, she will be in agony while the dairy farmer tries to treat her with an aspirin when we all know, uh, you know, so farmers know that a quick dose of antibiotics gets rid of the mastitis. The antibiotic uh, uh, use is not the issue, it's the abuse and misuse that it's the issue. Um, if you treat a bacteria, you treat it correctly and with the right medication, there is a limited chance of antimicrobial or antibiotic resistance. So uh, that you can have um, different, it's quite interesting, there are herbicides and pesticides which are uh, pretty vile um, but because they're organic, they're permitted in organic uh, certification, things like copper sulfates and other things, which are pretty grim. They're a nice good soil sterilizer. So, you know, the concept that you have to be organic to be regenerative is one that's lost. It just is not the case. You can be organic and regenerative and you can be regenerative and organic, uh, uh, organic but the two are not synonymous. You don't have to be one to be the other. Um, you know, can, can they coexist was, was an interesting question. I think they can coexist on the journey, but at some point we have to let go of the, the crutches that, that, you know, that have been developed because of the systems we use. So we look at genetically modified cotton, for instance, um, against the cotton weevil. We now know the cotton weevil is becoming resistant, if it's not already resistant in most places, to uh, glyphosate. And instead of going, ah, you know, let's change the system. What we're looking for is an even more radical chemical. Um, the cotton's telling us something. Um, and this is where I begin to sound like a hippie. But the cotton is telling us something. It's saying, please don't keep planting us in the same place at the same rate, because I will become sick. Um, it's the same with the chicken. You keep chickens in 20, 30,000 colonies. Chickens are coprophecal. They eat their own poo. So they're a petri dish of bacteria. But instead of moving them, rotating them, changing them, decreasing their stocking density, we just find more and ever stronger drugs. But at some point, we're going to fall off the cliff of drugs. There aren't going to be any stronger drugs. We're just going to have these bacteria running rampant, COVID-19 being a, an example of a virus running rampant. <coughs> so can we coexist on the journey? Absolutely, and we must. Is regenerative? A destination? No, it is a journey. So, you know, farmers who are on that journey are all welcome to join our regenerative program, but they must be doing regenerative things. They must be stopping the use of nitrogen. They must be stopping the use of, of, of glyphosate. They must be stopping the use, um, you know, of all of these systems that have destroyed our, our, our soils because soils are key to a regenerative future, but they are not the only key. They may be the golden key after three levels. Um, so I, I hope I've given you a, a very sort of 
swift overview of what we feel regenerative should mean and why it's absolutely crucial to the survival of our planet because our planet is made up of soils. Everything we eat or breathe comes out of the things that grow in that soil. You know, the, 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 the rainforests are our lungs. You know, to have some lunatic think you can put up a big metal box and, and filter the air is dealing with the symptoms. The cause is the way we live as a society and we have to adjust that and we have to give farmers back the power to farm with their land, on their land, and to make a fair living from doing it. Um, and if we cut out all the, the middle people um, you know, who are, are making money off farmers' backs and lying and cheating, um, I had a dear friend, and then we'll get on to the, to the questions because I've spoken more than enough. Uh, and and it, it's a beautiful quote, and, and the quote is this, um, highly processed organic snack bars are still highly processed it doesn't matter whether it's organic or not it's the system it's not the product you know it, it isn't food animal production that's causing all the issues in agriculture it's the way they are currently produced that's causing the problems in, in terms of greenhouse gas and then you know you've got the outside um you know uh, you've got the the outside pressure people with other agendas jumping in and confusing the space. So we're quite happy to help people answer any of those questions where it's like, let's go vegan or let's go vegetarian. Um, that's not an answer to anything, um, you know, because a lot of vegetables are produced in a way where they are sterilizing the soil uh, and polluting uh, the atmosphere. Um, if you go down into the West Coast, into California, the soil has sunk uh, some eight and a half inches because we've emptied the aquifers, pouring water onto salad vegetables. Um, you know, so the next time somebody says, eat vegetables, don't eat meat, I ask them about that water problem. Um, you know, because it's also impacted, sadly, all of the vile chemicals they use have come out into the ocean and they're uh, impacting the breeding ability of the sea otters. Um, you know, which, which to me, this is an holistic approach to the solution and regenerative could be it. Um, so I think we may have some questions if we want to unmute people. We'll try and yeah. do our best. We've got one um, question from Bella. Um, how, can, how can consumers impact this movement slash journey? Uh, we, we answer this a lot and Bella, thank you for the question. Thank you for being here. Um, just keep asking questions and ask your friends to ask questions, ask your family to ask questions. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, an old curmudgeon now, but my kids used to hate me because I'd sit in a restaurant and ask them where their meat came from. Um, you know, it wasn't a rude question. It was just, do you know? And, and you know, you'd get all sorts of answers from Smithfield to um, a distributor. And somebody might actually say Farmer John at some point. Um, education is key to this and sharing is key to this. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Um, I've heard that regenerative farming can be successful without animals. Would you please speak to this? Oh, that's a really good <laughs> question. Um, yes, it can. You can farm regeneratively without livestock providing your nutrient. Um, it relies as far, and, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not an expert in this space. I can get you somebody who is. Um, it relies a lot on composting vegetative matter um, and can be very successful. Can it be scaled? Well, there's only so much vegetative matter, so I wonder. Um, and the, the other thing we have to understand is we would have to give up, you know, some of these so-called efficiencies. So we're going to need to use most of the planet. So we would see ruminants growing on pasture where you can't actually grow vegetables and other things. Um, you know, and obviously you, you'll probably gather we're not fans of, of highly processed um, plant-based um, burgers, which really have no role in this because they're patentable. Um, and, and the only reason people are doing it is to make money. Um, there's a really good piece of research came out this week. Uh, it's waiting to be peer reviewed. And it talks about the nutritional value of, uh, clean meat, if you will, you know, just standard, uh, un, unprocessed meat. Um, and I think I can't remember which one of the idiot burgers it is. 
um, and the idiot burger comes out as not having available nutrients and actually having some ANFs, anti-nutritional factors, if that matters to anything. An anti-nutritional factor is when you eat something um, and it has the effect of you not being able to recover the nutrients within it. Um, it's particularly to chickens. And if you haven't gathered, I'm a chicken guy more than I'm anything. So we have a couple more questions. I, I and we may not have time for everybody, but Six we can minutes. handle the rest offline. Um, okay, so we've got a few that came in earlier. Um, can regenerative agriculture work side by side with conventional agricultural practice? I, I think I touched on it. I, I think ultimately no, but on its journey, yes. I, th I think you know it, we we we. <sighs> you know it's sort of what do you want to keep from conventional what is conventional um you know confinement feeding of 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 ruminants is an absolute insane idea um they're competing with us for food resources why would you do that there's all this beautiful grass and highland uh there's a piece of research came out three years ago i think it was done by the national trust that talked about uh sheep uh in the highlands and if I'm wrong, guys, I'm sorry. It could have been in New York, Dales, but it was somewhere up high and these sheep were effectively carbon neutral. So all the protein they produced was carbon neutral. Why, why wouldn't you have that in a sustainable chain? I think you have to ask the question, um, you know, the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we want a sustainable balanced diet that protects the world? Or do we just want to eat because of our moral position and otherwise? I, I, I'm sort of a little struggling to have that conversation about why people want to do certain things. Um, you know, if you look at the investors in, in some of these burger companies, they are not, um, you know, they, they are not necessarily, um, um, you know, in it for either improving the planet or otherwise they're looking at it to end animal agriculture and i think there needs to be more than one percent of the planet with that kind of thought process before we start thinking about it as a um you know as a genuine real um you know uh, way forward you know just as a democracy a global democracy we shouldn't be eating in the way one percent of our planet wants us to unless we are impacting them terribly um, what was the question you just posed to me, which I thought was super interesting? You've got three more. Um, so uh, Nasmil made a comment earlier, what works in one farm might not work for your crop and soil type uh, climate. Definitely. I think we agreed with that. Um, and yeah, then we have yeah. another comment, uh, question. Sorry, I missed the beginning. Do you advocate for all farms to be converted to regenerative farming? Surely there's not enough land on the planet. Um, yeah, of course there's enough land on the planet. We just got to stop throwing food away. Um, you know, and make shorter supply chains. We've got to stop expecting strawberries in bloody January in London. Um, excuse me, I, I dropped an expletive there. Um, you know, it, we, we, we've got to change who we are. We, we don't, it's not like an and or question or an option. There are 9 billion people coming 10 billion people on this planet. And we have to find a system that feeds them in a way that doesn't explode the planet. It, it's not a you know, it's not an if, it's a must. And, and yes, you, you take cattle out of feedlot and you shove them up <coughs> on the grasslands. You pay the grassland farmers a fair amount of money to, to, to grow their product. And most of all, you stop eating a three pound steak, North America. You know, we've, we've got to eat within our resources too. Nobody needs, a, 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 you know, a, a three pound steak. Just again, me on my soapbox, I am sorry. All good. So last two questions. We've got one from uh, another one from uh, Nesmeel. What do you think about, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right, apologies if not. Um, what do you think about the newer interest in carbon sequestration by soils and crops? Have you heard about deep rooted crops and how they contribute towards this? I mean, I think all of your science is accurate. There's a lot of science that talks to deep rooted crops having a, a better ability. I think it's very early stages in the research. I think my one concern uh, with carbon is carbon offsets. Um, we believe strongly that you should not be able to pollute the Jesus out of where you live or where you work and offset your deleterious action by planting trees somewhere else or whatever it might be. And we know there's a piece of research that talks about trees maybe not being as good at sequestering carbon as people originally thought. Um, you know, we, we, we are humbled um, to, to have been in this space. We, we were... Um, talking to a group of soil scientists out of Rothamsted, which has been measuring soil carbon for 117 years now, I believe. Um, and their answer was just to flood 
all the sandy loams where we grow vegetables. We'd sequester all the carbon in the world overnight. We just wouldn't be able to grow vegetables anymore. Um, clearly an unpalatable suggestion, but I think, you know, one of those things is we mustn't see regenerative as sequestering carbon. It's not. Um, it has that role. It can have their role. But there's this lovely world called equilibrium, which at some point the soil can't soak up any more carbon. It just sits there. It can't take any more. You can't improve its biodiversity, whether that's because of your precipitation, because obviously you need uh, moisture to, to, to improve bio, bio, soil biodiversity. Um, you know, it, I, I think that's an interesting question and, and, and you know, very relevant, but regenerative is so much more than just carbon. Thank you. <laughs> Last question, and if there's any more after this, feel free to email us and we'll be glad to get back with you. Uh, this is from Jen. Uh, Andrew, thank you for your comment. The best on the land is the farmer on the farm, 100% agree. How can we empower farmers to share their lifetime of knowledge and understanding of their land? <laughs> If you can answer that question, please come and join our marketing department. <laughs> um, I mean, sadly, society stopped seeing a farmer um, as an important person, um, as an integral part of their community. I, I'm fortunate I live in a rural community. Um, farmers are still seen as upright citizens and people who should be respected. Um, I think we have to enter the dialogue we have to be thick-skinned um you know i i follow a lady on twitter um who's much more thick-skinned than i am um who talks about dairying in upstate new york um there is a sad fact more and more people are living in houses and they don't actually want to work for a living and i'm sorry if that offends anybody on the phone um on on the call but you know they, they want to make their millions on a youtube video or they want to sit and play online games um, we just have to keep telling our story and we have to get together. We have to be one. And that's difficult with farmers because we all have different opinions on how to do things. I, I, it's not, I, I'm not lost on it. We try it every day, but at some point when people get hungry and I go back to this phrase and Emily and I have gone backwards and forwards on who the phrase belongs to, but I'll attribute it to at least somebody attached to or working with a first nation. Um, and they said this, that only when all the trees have been chopped down and all the fish in the river have gone, will we understand we can't eat money. And at that point, the world will understand it needs its farmers because at the moment we're detached. We have to reconnect the person with where their food comes from. I, I, I don't know we'll do it before there's a major catastrophe. And there was certainly here in the US with a shortage of food, people began to go, oh, poop. Um, you know, do we want a catastrophe? No. Are we going to have to have one? Perhaps. And on that bright note, <laughs> thank you everyone for joining us. <laughs> um, no, seriously, thank you everyone. Um, and thank you, Andrew. Um, if, if anyone does have any further questions, feel free to get in touch. Um, and we'd love to work with you in whatever ways we can. Um, and I think you should be getting updates from a greener world just by virtue of uh, signing up for this webinar. We look forward to sharing our progress with you. Um, any final words, Andrew? I just want to appreciate all of you for caring um, and taking a minute. Um, it, it, it's a crucial time in our lives, but I don't think all is lost. I, I think there are ways forward. We just have to work together. Um, and, and we do really, really have to let people know that farmers are the custodians of this countryside, not some group of whack jobs, you know, sat there having a good idea on a Sunday afternoon. Come and work with us. Come and talk to us. Come and see what we do. Um, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's going to be a challenging few years, but farmers have the solutions. We have the power. We just need to learn how to wield it. And one of the ways you can yield it is to be part of a bigger group working together, um, you know, which we're excited to do.